they've used postmodern theory to break down the boundaries of uh, what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, but that's not what uh, French cultural theorists primarily did. They analyzed the way power worked in culture, and that's what Foucault did. You know, Foucault uh, looked at the way power worked in institutions, in hospitals. His work was, was brilliant, really. I mean, I know it's been much maligned, um, but when you read it, you can see the way. But the problem is when you mix that with a Marxist framework, which, which he didn't as much, he probably did a little bit, um, you put culture in an oppressive and oppressive framework and everything goes to hell because, um, we're, you know, now we're, we're talking about who's oppressing each other, you know, in accordance with our sexual identities. And it's, it's of course, it's ridiculous. It's the logical consequence. What else is going to happen when you start framing When you, when you take sex out of the definition of adult human female, there's no other definition except for in culture. If you define a woman as a gendered object, one, one guy said, you know, we do this, we play this game on Twitter where we ask people, what is a woman? And they do it in politics as well. You know, you see it in, in the British. And we do it, obviously, because we all know what a woman is. And the, the game of the left means that they have to pretend they don't know. And, you know, you see Tanya Plebisek, God bless her, trying to, what Alan Jones was trying to, you know, worm out of this. We all know Tanya knows what a woman is, you know. And this guy came back to us, one of us once, and said, a woman is a person who, who assumes a submissive position in, in sex. And we all kind of just thought, well, that's back to the regressive sex stereotypes. But what else is going to happen? In, of course, you know, if you take your definition out of uh, scientific and, and, you know, material-based realities and you put them in culture, then you are giving your definition away to whoever runs the, the cultural hegemony. And so at the moment, the left run the culture. No matter who's in government, the left are in control of the culture. Of course. I want to talk about the woke phenomenon. Now... Uh, Northern Vibe listeners are mostly intelligent lay people, but a lot of us, and I include me in this, really don't know definitions and isn't. So can I get you to quickly define the woke, I suppose, politically correct movement? Um, and then I'd kind of like to discuss how, how it can be, uh, how it can be faced and overcome. Just, just to briefly to say that, <laughs> just yeah. briefly. Hey, look, I, 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 I know you're a sociologist. I, I know you're a sociologist, so it's like, the, <laughs> if you can give me the uh, 25 words or less. No, no, but, just, uh, well, no, but, I, but, 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 but not the PhD pieces. It's a cultural, <laughs> a cultural phenomenon. That's, it's, a, it's a way we've renegotiated um, our, our power to, to a power hierarchy. And so uh, in, in the vacuum of religion and all our other um, kind of cultural understanding, they've restructured and, and, and but people talk about it, but it's a sort of mixture, it's a contradictory mix of post-structuralism and Marxism. And it, it is because post-structuralism actually was saying that we was moving on from Marxism, was moving on from structuralist interpretations of power so they're into more complex ideas so but what it's done is it said it's got the same framework as um marxism but it puts it i mean people call it cultural marxism but i hate that term um it puts it does put those uh power hierarchies in culture but the culture is defined by the government so now if if a woman is defined by the government which is what they're saying that if woman is defining culture and gender and gender identity isn't situated in all our civil rights. It's all played out in the civil rights legislation. And in my opinion, it's just because my humble view is that if we go back to John Stuart Mill, yep. he basically said societies revert to tyranny. The same way that water finds its own level, the same way that you know an animal will go back to a well societies will go back to tyranny. And we, we build these uh, liberal democracies in a way where we have the checks and balances and no better example than America for that. Their constitution, 
um, is is rock solid. When I was at uni, we used to read the American Constitution, the Federalist Papers, all the great liberals, John Stuart Mill, as well as you know Locke and Hobbes, and all the all the great rock stars of you know social thought. But now they don't read them. They they look for ways to bypass the structures that have been set up to protect from corruption. So it's just a corruption. I think it's just a corruption uh, using using the social justice, using the, um, what do they call the processes, the laws around um, uh, minority protections to bypass other structures that are set up to protect the population from tyranny. Mm. That's, uh, that's what I think it's about. Mm. Um, it sounds like a conspiracy theory, but if you read the actual theories that underlie um, postmodernism and post-structuralism. They talk about these things, that, that, that there are human modes of power where, where we keep falling into the same habits. Maybe it's to do with who we are as people. Maybe it's the nature of government. But the way the government has grown and grown and grown, you notice that left-wing governments, I know in Queensland, uh, Campbell Newman scaled it down and Anastasia Palaszczuk has just blown it out. I mean, I, I heard how many, I can't remember how many advisors, media advisors alone she has. Like they've just, they make these massive, the way that that left-wing ideology embeds itself in government is turning into an authoritarian structure. Mm -hmm. And we have to fight it at the grassroots. I, I think we have to move away from woke, non-woke, left, right, and develop some kind of grassroots um, resistance movement. I mean, I love all these, you know, people call those, you know, all the people that are protesting against the mandates. You know, I, I just think we need to, every opportunity we get, we need to resist uh, speech mandates, all these friggin' he, hims, and she, hers, uh, pronouns. We need to just keep going against them at every level mm -hmm. and figure out, organize in a way what we have to figure out how to organize to, to oppose them. Hmm. That wasn't short, was it? No, no, it was good though. Um, one of the things I do want to bring to our listeners um, is your work. Now, I'm just going to, uh, first, okay. I want to discuss your, uh, the article, your first article that came to my attention. But while I've got everyone, I really do want to plug um, Edie's work. Now, she's, uh, she's very well published. She's published in The Spectator Australia, which is the longest continuously published magazine in the English language. Um, so she's got a number of articles there. So if you, get, if you Google Spectator and put um, Edie Wyatt in the search thing, that will come up. She's got her own excellent website, if, if, um, if I can make the observation. So I'm going to blow that out and open that up a bit. So there's some really, really interesting articles in here that I've been that I've been going going through all morning. It's definitely it's definitely um, worth having a really good look at um, at Edie's website. But let's talk about your article because I think it kind of like leads into and sums up what's going to happen. Now Edie wrote this article for Quillette magazine, which is another uh, which is another great source of information that I, that I unashamedly plug. Um, she's written this article last year. My white privilege didn't save me, but God did. Now, Edie, I'll get you to walk through this. What's a good left-wing soci sociologist doing believing in the whole God thing? And right. can you, and can you, and, and, and ending up voting conservative? Like that's a, that's a really interesting story. So Walk us, walk us through that journey, um, and the article pretty much does, I know, but let's, let's walk through that. Sure. I, I don't think it's an unusual story. I think a lot of us, I grew up in a, a left-wing uh, working-class suburb, a housing commission estate in Brisbane, which is not unusual. I think Anastasia uh, had a similar, uh, I think she grew up in Anala, which is a similar kind of suburb. Um, and uh, my mm -hmm. father was a cockney. Uh, I was English working class. My mother was uh, descended from convicts. Um, uh, I had uh, childhood sexual violence and as well as a range of other things. I had a family who I loved very dearly, my cousins and, and uh, siblings, um, most of whom have uh, died uh, through 
range of circumstances. Um, and uh, I have I went to a went to university. I was homeless for a period of time, and then I went to university and I studied uh, uh, humanities. Uh, it was a it was a groundbreaking at, at Griffith University. It was a groundbreaking degree at the time because it was uh, based a lot in French cultural theory. I did I did cultural theory and uh, polit politics, um, and joined a socialist organisation. But I, I suffered from crippling uh, fear uh, and emotional problems as a result of uh, sexual violence and uh, childhood sexual abuse, um, and I couldn't get myself together. You know, my mother was mentally ill. She had Huntington's disease, which a lot of my family had. Um, she was an alcoholic. I couldn't, I, I couldn't get my shit together. Uh, one day, I, I smoked a lot of pot, I drank a lot. You know, uh, it's not uncommon uh, in in our culture. Um, and one day, I just uh, collapsed, and I found a Bible, um, and I read a scripture, and. Uh, it, I just, I still remember that point. I was on the floor of the house I was staying in and, you know, it was one of those, you know, heaven came down moments. And I then a few weeks later, maybe even a few months later, I ended up in this Baptist church uh, with the most conservative people that you can imagine. And I was, you know, as Doc Martin wearing, you know, a socialist preacher. Um, and they were so kind to me, you know, they were so good to me. Uh, and, you know, I said in the article, I, I'll never forget, I'll never forget them. And I'll never uh, fail to defend the rights of fundamentalist Christians. Because, you know, they were very profound, a very fundamentally believing group. And I was a pain in the ass. And they really loved me, you know, and they looked after me. Uh, and they cared for me in a way that I hadn't, I had never known before. Um, and I met my husband there and got married. Um, and I, the practices of the Christian faith were very important to me. And I was talking about them before about the boundaries of uh, where women are. When you, when you have had uh, violence, particularly sexual violence as a woman, you find men hard to trust. It's very difficult to be in their physical space. You know, you, you know, it's not easy for a young woman, um, which is one of the reasons I, I advocate for single sex protections, because even with a different, different gender identity, young women know a man, you know, and they, they need space and they need some. And that's why I started to, that's why I wrote the articles, because I wanted to say, you know, these minority sexual and gender identities are not the only people that need things. Women have needs. And we've acknowledged them in culture. The protection of women from sexual violence is a very important thing. It's not just a thing that we did once and we succeeded in and now we're gonna do something else. We, we always have to center uh, women and girls in, in a way to protect them from this risk. It's always gonna be there. So um, then I uh, still was left wing for many years. Uh, and loved, always loved the scriptures. I loved to read, you know, I, I, I don't think I ever really became, I certainly didn't become right wing, uh, right wing Christian or whatever they call us, fundamentalist Christian. Um, but I, I, I always practiced, you know, loved the practice of the faith. And um, then one year, uh, Kevin Rudd said, he went on Q&A and he said, uh, the the, the same-sex marriage debate was happening and he said the Bible endorses slavery. And that was a turning point for me. Um, I, because I remembered all those years later, I left, I went and worked for the government for a few years and I, we run our own business for many years. But I started to remember all those things I learned in cultural theory. You know, it all came back to me. I thought, this is a bad idea because you're, you're putting the cultural definition of sexuality in the government. This is very bad. This is a violation of the separation of church and state. So all those kind of that sociological training came back. Um, and 
I guess when the gay marriage debate came, it wasn't that I was against gay marriage. It was that I knew that the whole bunch of identity stuff, this gender identity stuff that came with it was bad for girls particularly. And, and now I meet with a lot of people online. I'm in a little group, a Twitter group with some gay guys and gay women. Um, and they don't like it either because it invalidates their existence. Mm -hmm. So um, I started these conversations like many of us did. We, we were in the left. I thought I, would, I was born voting Labor, even though I couldn't vote when I was born, but I was always going to vote Labor. Yeah. You know, who else was anyone going to vote for? I thought I would die voting Labor. But, you know, when they were taken over, uh, it, it affected my religion to start with because I thought, hang on, what about freedom of religion? And then I realised the wider, the broader implications. And it wasn't until I wrote that that I entered um, that I really understood. I listened to lesbians um, about how they were being affected. And I learned about the cotton ceiling, which I wish I could unlearn, um, and how they were, they were not being allowed to have their own single sex spaces. And I figure that if they can't have, if we, if they can't, if a lesbian can't have a single sex space, then we can't have our women's prayer retreat. And a lot of Christians don't understand that. They don't quite get the, the broader implications. And because I have a degree in sociology, because I've got that basis in cultural theory, I thought, well, I've got to write, start writing and talking about these issues because they're ignored. Well, of course they're ignored by the left, but they're completely being missed by the right as well. Um, some, some people have tried to, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I felt like I needed to talk about that stuff. So you you know you do in this magnificent article you talk about um, how it's important it's important that biology you know a recognition of reality needs to be at the at, at the center of that. But you also talk too about um, the importance of forgiveness and healing, and how the and the and concerns about the weaponization of victimhood. Hmm. Is that something you be willing to kind of? Yeah, I I think. One of the things I learned when I first became a Christian, and that's a thing about structures of belief, is that they do give us signal posts to direct our lives. And one of the things Christian believe in is, is Christians do believe in is leaving, uh, leaving victimhood behind. And, you know, I felt really early on God telling me that I needed to walk away uh, from the identity of being a victim. And I very rarely, you know, we call ourselves survivors because that's part of the, the discourse that we engage in. But I very rarely I would identify myself. I don't think I would ever call myself a victim um, because I'm not a victim. I was a victim. Um, and um, I certainly, I did take that through the courts as well. And the conviction was made. And, and then I just left it behind. You know, I don't think that, justice was served terribly well but you have to you can't carry this stuff with you your whole life because it will kill you and it was killing me I, I know that it was killing me uh, before I came into the church um, before I met God I, there's not there's not any words in the world where you could convince me that God didn't save me um, and people say that now they talk about your journey of faith and if you've got questions. Sure, I mean, my faith has changed. I've got different ideas about things. But uh, that, that walking away from, you know, we talk about in the Christian world, the burdens, uh, uh, releasing the burden. You can't do that. We have, a, we have a fundamental belief in forgiveness. It's not negotiable. God doesn't say, yeah, you can forgive that person, but that's really, really bad. You can't forgive that. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta clean it all up. And so I forgave um, everybody, uh, including my parents who didn't protect me properly. Um, I absolutely forgive them. And uh, there's no way I could have recovered without that. Um, I, I just couldn't have. It took me years to understand because um, I was a, I was a cradle Catholic and kind of went away and, and came back. Um, 
I never really understood the freedom thing like earlier. And it's like, what does this talk about freedom all the time? Freedom mm. from what? And like, I suppose, you know, living in the, being born in the seventies, living in very, very free times. And, you know, mm. what, it, what it took me, what it took me some years to understand was there's actually a hierarchy of things you need to be freed from. So obviously that's the material needs of like, so first you've got to have enough food in your stomach. And I've never been starving, starving. Um, but like I lived in out of Mongolia for a little while and I've, I've seen hunger. I didn't, I've, I've never experienced real hunger. I'm not going to misrepresent it, but, I, but I've seen it. Yeah. Um, and I know how debilitating that, that is. Like people can't think. They, they yeah. can't. Like you, you become, you're a slave to your body. Like, you know, you, you just start. Same yeah. with water. Like if people get truly, truly thirsty and believe it or not, everyone associates Mongolia with snow and it's true. But it's a really dry place. Like people mm. get thirsty, like seriously thirsty there. But one of the other things that I, I came to understand was that you needed to be freed from these things that had happened to you before that are really in danger of defining who you are. Mm. So, you know, you can yeah. define yourself by, you can define yourself by something that's happened to you um, and that's really dangerous. But alternatively, if you've done something really wrong and, and really hurt someone, you're in equal and perhaps greater danger of defining yourself by that as well. Mm. And that yeah. can become definitive and, and you need to be able to free yourself. From yes. The, the, well, that's the, the thing about go. Christ, isn't it? He's at the centre of the cross. Some people say, you know, I believe in all this. I, okay, I believe that there's a God and all the rest of it, but I can't believe in the resurrection. Oh, it's, it's right at the centre. You well, know, the, the death and resurrection of Christ is the centre of our faith. It's, it's how we cross over. Uh, you know, we talk about being born again, and that's, that's absolutely how I felt. It's not that all my problems went away. It's not that I didn't have to deal with crap. It's not that I still don't have crap to deal with. We are, we are encased in a body. You know, we are sort of, what does Paul say, you know, this body of death. We, we, are, we are anchored to the, to the world. Um, but our spirit, that's, you know, that's what frees us. Probably the implications for that is polit from politics is the danger of the victim um, politics um, and, and carrying that over and over. The sins of our fathers and trying to keep shoving them down people's throats. Um, we have to acknowledge that things, and that's the same with, um, you know, how I... I guess structure feminism is that yeah I'm, I'm not saying that all men are pricks and we should keep them all away from girls and set up separate cities you know I'm saying that there's a risk um, and we need to be honest about who we are um, and to, to protect uh, so that we can live you know our best lives um, yeah, but forgiveness, it was, I wanted to write, after I wrote that, someone asked me to write about how I forgave my mother, and I have made meaning to write it, but the thing is, that sort of writing costs something, you know, um, it's kind of easier to write about politics than it is to write about stuff, uh, mm -hmm. and, and what I meant to write about was how my politics was very much shaped uh, by my experience and we can't deny that I don't think um, that who, who we are where we come from and what we experienced um, really and that's why I think we've got so many problems with the elite you know these these guys who uh, and women who've never lived anywhere but you know either in the Canberra bubble or in you know uh, Sydney or Melbourne in these uh, these top levels of our society um, and they make policy and, and all they talk about is how, you know, horrible men are and how, um, how you know, the colonials, have, you know, wrecked our lives. We, we, can't, we can't, you can't be living in that reality. It's, it kills you. Well, it's, it's not even a reality, really. Like it's, no, again, it's a fantasy, it, isn't it? it? It has some degree of truth to it, but it's, you yeah, see, that's... Course, yeah. You know, that's the thing when I'm discussing this with anyone. Like, you can't come out and say it's all complete codswallop because they go, well, what about this? 
And, you know, some of them will even get Kathy Newman on you and, and go, are you saying that there's no such thing as racism? It's like, oh, no, no, no. Are you saying there's no such thing? Oh, God, like, you know. <laughs> They're boring. Aren't they conversations boring? <laughs> no, but, like, you know, it, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to, like, yeah. if you seriously want to, and what I try and do, to, and part of it's Jordan Peterson, part of it's, like, my, my old job, it's like, like listen, just, yes. just, just shut up and listen because even the, even the most, like, people will genuinely, if you're seriously listening to someone, they will genuinely, even the most manipulative liar will tell you what they think mm. or what they actually want. That will be revealed. They can't, you, you can't help it. That will come out. No matter how much of a practice liar you are, doesn't matter. You know, you could be Peter Foster, but it's still, it, it's, it's, it's going to come out. It yeah. will come out. And so what I try and do is just discuss stuff with people and just kind of see what they're, where they're coming from. And I'm convinced that most people even the really ideologically poisoned ones, they're coming from the right place. It, it's like yeah. I use this analogy and it's a simplistic one um, that you've got a good brain. So you've got a computer, it's got RAM memory, okay? You could have the best computer in the world. Most memory, all that kind of stuff connected to the internet, yada, yada. But if you're running a really bad program on that computer, it doesn't matter how much the, no. it's the program that you're running on the computer. And so I think that we can change you know, the program that, that, that people 